A Musical Life with indie folk singer and songwriter Gregory Allen Isakoff. Gregory Allen Isakoff is a fascinating, conscientious singer-songwriter based in Boulder, Colorado. Some of his best-known songs are The Stable Song, Raising Cain, and Big Black Car, which was featured in a 2012 McDonald's holiday commercial. Greg balances a busy touring and recording schedule with life on his four-acre farm, where he raises animals, bees, and a variety of crops thanks to his degree in horticulture. His songs explore facets of everyday life with thought-provoking lyrics and vivid word imagery thanks to his love of prose and writing. This episode of A Musical Life is brought to you by Airturn, featuring the Go Stand, the world's most portable, full-size mic stand that collapses to fit in your backpack. Learn more at amusicallife.com forward slash airturn. And stay tuned till the end of the show for a special discount coupon code to save 10% off of the ghost stand. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. I have to give special thanks to our associate producer, Alison Pokras, for introducing me to Gregory Allen Isakoff's music. Allison actually grew up together with Greg after he immigrated from South Africa to Philadelphia at the age of seven. Greg has spent his entire life traveling, and much of those experiences are expressed in his music. Greg's songs have been featured on several TV shows and commercials, and he's collaborated with the likes of Brandy Carlisle, Amy Ray of the Indigo Girls, and the Colorado Symphony Orchestra. At the same time, he cherishes putting down roots, both figuratively and literally, as evidenced with his working four-acre farm and passion for organic farm practices. Before we get started, I have some announcements to make. We have winners for our first two weeks of the contest we're running to celebrate the launch of A Musical Life Podcast. The winner of week one is Maria from Cleveland. She's getting a free copy of pianist Gary Grafman's album performing the three Tchaikovsky piano concertos. And for week two, our winner is Jim from Essex in the UK. He's getting a free copy of the complete works of Brahms for violin and piano, performed by legendary violinist Aaron Rosand and me on the piano. Congratulations, Maria and Jim. Thanks so much for joining our family. And we still have six weeks left in our contest with new special prizes every week. This week's prize will be an album by Dream Theater's keyboard wizard, Jordan Rudis, Explorations for Keyboard and Orchestra, a fantastic set of original compositions crossing rock and classical lines. To sign up for our contest, visit amusicallife.com forward slash contest. It's completely free, and every participant will automatically get a special thank you gift, an MP3 track of my performance of Claire de Lune by Debussy. Once again, that's amusicallife.com forward slash contest. Now, let's listen to an excerpt from one of Gregory Allen Isakoff's most popular songs, The Stable Song. A ring like silver, a ring like gold Bring out those ghosts on the Ohio Ring like clear day, wedding bells But with the belly of the beast and the sword that Greg, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you, Hugh. So for folks like myself <laughs> who have never heard your music before, now I have to confess I'm a classical musician. I'm a bit of a cloistered soul, but I've had an opportunity to explore your songs. And I have to say I am so deeply impressed by the depth and beauty of your your music and your writing. And I'm wondering, it's interesting because we were having a little bit of a pre-interview discussion about this. My initial question was going to be, what are some songs that you could recommend? But you made a really interesting point. When you write, you don't write 
with a single song in mind, but you really think of it almost like a novelist. You, you're thinking it would be almost the same thing as me asking, what chapter of <laughs> such and such a book can you yeah. recommend when you're actually thinking, no, this is a whole work. So let me rephrase the question. Sure, yeah. What album would you recommend somebody who's brand new to your music to get started with? Yeah, you know, the, the most recent one that we made um, is called The Weatherman. And, you know, and it's something that I, this is a long kind of, uh, sort of a, a long game for me is, is sort of really we're always after trying to make this this complete piece of work and I, I don't know if I've ever nailed it you know and I think that's what kind of kind of moves me um I'm always after it you know um but I think I got cl I got closer with with that one <laughs> um yeah When you're thinking of the album, do you think like a novelist does, where they, they have a story arc, you have a beginning, a plot, a climax, a conclusion? Do you think along those terms? Not not per se. Um, it's It might not be as literal as that, but um, they just have a sort of... Um, it kind of take you somewhere. And then, and then when I think, I think this can be said about a good song or, or a good record, but um, they sort of take you somewhere and, and, and kind of, and, and return you and you're a little bit different, you know? And I think that for me, I, I write way more than I, than I keep, you know? Mm. Um, and I think a good song is just, is really just, um, well, how does, does this make me feel something, you know? And I think that's really the bottom line. And that's, that's always what I'm at, what I'm after the emotional quality of, of a piece of music. Well, Grace, she's gone, she's a half-written poem She wound out for cigarettes and never came home and I swallowed the sun and screamed and waved Straight down to the dirt so I could find her trail Spread out across the great divide Would you be able to share a little bit of the backstory of the weatherman or perhaps even sure. delve into some of the emotions yeah. that you're exploring through, sure. this, through these songs? Um, you know, and each record sort of has that kind of, for me, um, with, um, with the weatherman, you know, it started out, um, I had made a record, uh, the record b before that, that, that I'd put out was called this empty Northern hemisphere. I had made another record, um, after that, which I ended up shelving. I, hmm. I had kind of finished it. I'd finished the whole thing. And then, and then I, I love the, you know, I think being an independent musician and, and, and not really being, you know on a, on a major label is really great for this process, this kind of freedom to, to let a record kind of sit for a while and come back mm -hmm. to it and make sure, make sure, you know, it still it is working on you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I ended up, I ended up finding that it didn't really work uh, mm -hmm. a few months after I'd made it. And so I sort of just put it up on the shelf for a little while and then made the weatherman pretty, pretty quickly. Um, I was in Europe, um, and I recorded a lot of it in Amsterdam and then I came back and, and finished it. Mm. Um, here, but mm. I, I, you know, I'd started writing some short stories, actually, I, more of, a, more of a sort of wake up and, and work on prose. And mm. a lot of it doesn't really make it into the music once in a while, like a line here and there, um, will, but I sort of, that's sort of my clocking in practice, I guess, mm. <laughs> it's just mm. kind of the, kind of just the prose really. And then when I sit down with, with the guitar or piano or, or banjo or something, I, I sort of, let it let it do its thing but i 
I think um, with the weatherman, it was interesting. I was, I was writing a, a bunch of short stories um, called the weatherman. And it was about this, this trailer park or this woman that lived in the trailer park in, in New Mexico. And, and she kind of goes a little bit crazy and, and she doesn't really have any friends or family. And she starts having these conversations with this character, uh, this weatherman character on the, on the television, <laughs> kind of tells, tells her what's going to happen and tells her the, the future, which is sort of where, where, where the kind of idea came for the record, because um, it, it's sort of a lot of the songs found them, themselves on there. That was just sort of about, um, um, I was really interested in, you know, spending a line or two of a, of a, of a song on just like walking and noticing how light kind of hits a room or, or how your shadow kind of interacts with, with something. And, mm. and, um, I, I sort of go, was, that was kind of my curiosity about, about that record and trying to be as simple as I could. Mm. Um, and so that's how it kind of started. It sounds as if you are working in multiple metaphors at once, the, the need for prescience, to no, need to know the future, but also yeah. it sounds like word pictures trying to evoke imagery from the way the light hits the room. Would that be an accurate description of the themes you explore and wrestle with? It is, yeah. I think, um, you know, there's always the emotional quality of what, what the human experience that we're, I'm always trying to that's like the root of it. But I think, um, you know, like the weather is something really interesting because, you know, you're on a train or, or on a bus and, and the first conversation you'll have with the stranger is probably about the weather, <laughs> you know, or, you know, there's this guy on the radio or television telling us what, what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, it's like this amazing miracle <laughs> in a way, but mm -hmm. no one cares, you know, everyone's just like, okay, yeah, it's going to rain tomorrow. It's the first frost is tonight. That's what I'm lear learning <laughs> right now. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's amazing that we, we just have all of this insight and, and, and no one really notices how amazing that is, you know? Hmm. And so I think, I think that that's kind of what I, I was getting after with, with the record, the kind of base story of it, which I don't know if anyone will ever really take, but that's sort of the background. Hmm. The wonder of being able to see into the future. Is that a little bit of what you're exploring? Or? <laughs> yeah, sort of just the mundane miracle ah, of, of, ah. of sort of just um, of just this experience. Fascinating. Mundane miracles, everyday miracles. Yeah. <laughs> Bicycle bells, the dark had wooden teeth Oh, we broke on up to hill country The air was thin and sweet Lord, the air was thin and sweet She held on to my coat that night Like a kid lost in her sleep Oh, we warmed the ground, we hushed our sound We slept on walking feet Lord, we slept on walking feet Oh, darling, pardon me Can you help me remember when we were all flying? from our 
bodies and we were flicker and flame. Yeah, we burn till the morning, darling. Pardon me. Now, you were born in Johannesburg, South Africa, and you came to the U.S. when you were seven and grew up in the Philadelphia area. Now, I've actually visited the southernmost tip of South Africa, mainly Cape Town, Mossel Bay, yeah. Port Elizabeth, and I was struck with how breathtakingly beautiful South Africa is. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering, can you do you remember what life was like when you were in Joburg? Yeah, you know, I mean, I have like little kid memories, you know, mm. and I, I'm like little kid, like, like checking out flowers and picking mangoes and, and, you know, riding my bike around, you know, and, and, you know, I, I've been back, um, since and, and noticing like, Oh, my driveway wasn't, you know, three miles long. It's like, <laughs> it's like 15 feet, <laughs> you know? And so, so it's sort of like a different kind of take on it, but, it, but, you know, I, I do have a good, I have strong memories from there, I, you know, so I moved when I was seven. So mm. I think, Turning in the grain again The bells begin to chime Time, she says, there's no turning back Keep your eyes on the tracks Through the fields, somewhere there's blue Oh, time will tell, she'll see us through What music was playing in your home when you were growing up? You know, a lot of Paul Simon. Um, mm. My parents liked that a lot. And um, Beatles. And I used to have this, like, We Are the World single. Do you remember that? Song? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so I would just, I remember sitting in front of the record player, just playing that over and over and over and over again. Mm. And staring at the cover of all the people that were part of that song, you know. And that's how I got into, like, Springsteen and, you know, um, just everyone that kind of compiled that song. I was really into, I was really into Michael Jackson. I think that I still am, you know. <laughs> what was it about that album that drew you in? It sounds like that was a, a yeah, that was album. A, that, that was a big one. Um, it was sort of like the gateway for me, of, you know, into kind of the music that I, I kind of still listen to in a, in a weird way, you know. Mm. Um, I don't really know what it was about that that song has something so infectious to me at the time. Mm -hmm. now, did you have formal music lessons as a child? I, um, you know, I, I played jazz saxophone in school, um, <laughs> and, uh, some drums too. Wow. And, um, but guitar was sort of something I had a hard time with music because I had a weird relationship to it because it was like this kind of, it's an, and I'm sure you can relate in a classical sense, but it had so much structure around it and so much, um, rigidity. Yeah. Rigidity and labor, you know, a mm. lot of labor. And, and I have that to with, I have a relationship like that now, but it, it's not coming from a formal place. It's not coming from a very rigid place. So gu guitar was sort of my break from all of that, you know, mm. when I would kind of go home, um, playing in jazz band and stuff. Um, you know, I'd sort of just like hide in the basement and play my brother's electric and <laughs> and it was sort of something just for me. And you know, it didn't have a teacher's face behind it, didn't have any formal training behind it. And I think it was that's what kind of stuck for me. It's well it's amazing. So did you teach yourself to play? Yeah. That's incredible. And I think what's also incredible, I remember being in the jazz band myself and it was the most terrifying class for me because it I was forced to sight read. Sure, music yeah. and I, I, it was the scariest thing, you know, 
for a single line instrument is one thing, but when you're playing the piano, you see all these crazy chords and horrible handwritten music. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I, I was terrified of jazz band. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I can really relate to your, uh, your distaste for the, the formality of it. I, yeah. And I think at that time in my life too, I ended up dropping out of high school for a while and mm. I'm traveling a bit, but I, I think it was like all kind of structure in my life, I was just ready to learn something different. And um, I think that a lot of music kind of spawned from that as well. Hmm. Now, when you said you dropped out of school for a while, was that when you toured with the band when you were 16? Um, I did that, no, during school. I, I was, a, yeah, I was around 17 when I dropped out of high school. Um, I was a junior, a junior? Yeah, that's, that's a thing. <laughs> 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 and um, I ended up going to the Middle East and traveling around a bunch. Oh my goodness. Wow. Uh, I was just very, you know, I was, I was really ready. I was really ready to not sit down um, anymore. <laughs> I think I, you know, and I think my poor parents, man, it's just. Yeah. I was going to ask you about your parents. Were they, <laughs> were, were, were they supportive of this need to, just be free of the shackles of uh, academia? They were cool um, as, you know, within reason. I'm sure if I put myself in their shoes now, I'm, that sounds so stressful. But <laughs> I, they were, you know, it was tough for them, I think, you know. But they expressed that to you? or Oh, how, yeah, how, yeah, how yeah. You know? it, was, it was definitely a, a tumultuous time, mm, <laughs> you know. Mm. And yet it sound, sounds like they still supported yeah. you at the same time. You <laughs> they, know? they always have, yeah, they always oh, have. Incredible. So uh, I, ha I guess I have a dual question. I was wondering what kind of music you played with when you were touring with your first band. Um, you know, it was sort of um, it's still song based, you know, a lot of um, similar stuff th that I do now, just like terrible writing. And, um. <laughs> so were these all originals or yeah, were, were you doing, yeah, were you, yeah. so you weren't doing covers, <laughs> were you? Not very many, you know, I think we played like an REM song or something. I don't really. <laughs> I think there was like there was there was maybe an REM song in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you were sixteen. And how old was everybody else in the band? Sixteen as well. Yeah, it was just me and my friends. You know. Oh, very cool. folk music it sounds like paul simon was an influence on you very young springsteen was an influence yeah you know i was in a lot of other bands too in high school that were more kind of heavy you know like uh <laughs> really like like metal and and i played drums in all, like a grunge band and i did all sorts of you know different kind of i was re that was the music that i was really that I was really passionate about and then i would kind of go to my room and realize that the music that kind of it happens naturally is, is nothing like that. Huh. And I think, I think it took a long time for me to kind of be cool with that. Hmm. Um, were you, were you, how, I don't want to say ashamed. Were you, were you afraid of what other people might've thought since you had this one face, so to speak, playing this heavy metal music and then this very personal, intimate uh, expression? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, it's funny. I think, I think it maybe every high school kid, age, high school age kid at the time probably, you know, wanted to sound like Tool or, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and then that whole process, um, that, on, on that discovery of, of kind of like, what, what is my writer's voice? What, what is my actual sound here? Um, 
what comes natural to me. I think that's like a really long process and I think I'm still learning it, you know. It's it's an intensely personal process. I think the most yeah. the most frightening thing about writing music is you're really bearing your soul in a way that's f- much more intense than I think most people realize. Oh yeah. And I think that's something, you know, kind of that I'm noticing now years later that, you know, oh, I'll hear a song that maybe um I can hear a song like made from maybe someone really new at it and sort of has this kind of journal, like, um, you know, this very simple and plain over emotional quality to it. Mm. That's like got some guts. It's good, mm. but, but it doesn't really have the the craft yet to kind of make it relatable mm. or, um, mm. or more subtle, you know? And I think, I, th- I think that's, that's been, you know, like such a huge thing for me. Mm. Searching for the subtlety in your expression. Yeah, or just like, oh, that sounds like a high school journal. Like, let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let's hold the reins on that one. <laughs> I work mornings in the old yard, digging in the ground. But I moonlight as an astronaut, mostly just sit around and how Won't you come to my house? Tonight We could sleep on the floor I got this window That looks out to Orion I paid extra for I'll forget about the sun He's forgotten us by now Kiss me so I I understand that you've toured extensively, and even at one point, it's, you were living in your car for a while. Is that right? Yeah, you know, I I so I just kind of I always I went I came to school in Colorado for horticulture, and that's what I, I studied. Um, so that was a huge part of my life. But I lived on this farm that um, the owners of the farm kind of were so cool and supportive of mm. just my writing and, and music and. And never charged me rent while I was on tour and oh, stuff like incredible. that. Oh, that's incredible. Wow. And so I, I was just sort of really lucky. So I would sort of um, just go camping in Montana. And I was like, all right, well, I'll just book a few shows here and there to pay for the, you know, pay for gas and campsites and all that stuff. So it sort of started out of this love of, of travel um, mm. for me because I, I was fine playing in my kitchen by myself, mm. you know, and as far as I knew, like I didn't, there wasn't th- this need for anyone to hear it, you know? And now that is such a, an amazing part of, of this, of this, of what I do now. It's invaluable to me. Like the, the fact that people will find parking and like come out after work and, mm. and hear music is just blows my mind. You know? Well, let's spend a little bit of time on this because it sounds like your music was deeply personal, deeply intimate and you were perfectly content just keeping it to yourself. How how did you make the transition from making music just for yourself and sharing it with other people? I think it's. I think I'm. I think I'm still transitioning. <laughs> I, um, I, uh, I think it came from from traveling. Yeah, like a like, you know, this simple. There was like a very. There's like this this job part of music, which I, I was I never thought of it like a job, you know. Mm. And now that I'm doing it full time, it's sort of like my 15 year old dream, you know. <laughs> and um, you know, because I was like laying flagstone, doing doing landscaping, and then I would have a gig in the mountains at like a ski resort or something, you know, hmm. or at a bar, mm-hmm. and be like, dang, like I just made like a day and a half of flagstone and like a, <laughs> <laughs> like a 45 minute set, you know. <laughs> So, you know, there was that part, but no one gets into music to make money. I mean, that's not really why we we do that. But I realized that like, oh, this is a possibility. I could really learn about this and and it scared the shit out of me. I really Mm. had a hard time Mm. um, playing in front of people. And I still, I don't think I've gotten over being nervous or having that kind of nervous energy, but I'm cool with it now.
I, I'm curious, since you were in school, you were studying horticulture, and I want to get into that in just a bit, and you were working in landscaping and just doing normal things that many folks do when they have music on the side, but they have to make a living. When was the moment that you thought to yourself about a career in music and thought that, hey, this might actually work? It's crazy. I mean, I think I think I sort of just needed it. I needed it in my mm-hmm. life. It, it came out of this place of need more than this more than any biz, bad scheme business plan. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think I, I don't think I would do it if I felt any other way, really, because it can be it's arduous and it's um, yes. it is very personal and it's you know we travel like a lot and mm-hmm. um, normal. The, the normal like routine is, is something that I treasure now in this mm. in a really deep way. But mm. I, I haven't had any of that in a long time, you know? Mm. So can you describe what that need actually is? What, what is it that music fulfills? Is it the, the urge to, to create the urge to connect with other people, the urge to travel? I think it is. I think it really is all of that combined mm. in this kind of amazing, um, kind of um, insane uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, prospect because I think it is a it, it is a crazy thing to do when when I really like look at my <laughs> life <laughs> but I um, it, it feeds me on this level that I, it's almost ineffable I don't even know how to mm, mm. describe it and it's painful too it's it, when it doesn't work and when mm. it's mm. and when things aren't working you know mm. or you're having a bad night or you know countless things can go wrong and there's a lot of a lot of variables you know Mm, mm. um but i think the basis of 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 a piece of music going on in the background of uh, when i'm like driving you know to go for a hike or go to the grocery store or something that that i'm always kind of working on there's this mad scientist with a swinging light over his head sort of always in the background you know (laughs) Mm, mm. and i i love that kind of um relationship with with like a, this world that, that that you can create and invite people into, you know. And what's fascinating too is that you, as you described in the beginning of this interview, you really are this mad scientist taking the elements of everyday life and transforming them into something breathtakingly beautiful, mystical, magical. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's. I think. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, you know, as artists, you know, we're, we're kind of this lens to help people see that their lives are far more precious than most people realize. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, I. Um, I definitely think so. Now, yeah. you know, there was a, there was a long time where, um, as, you know, and and I still am very involved in the environmental movement and and organic farming movement and. I, my friends that are like kind of grown up now, or they're grown ups now, are like doctors and helping people on these crazy levels. Where I and I'm like, I think about them in a tour bus or a van or or an airplane, and I'm like, what am I doing? Mm. You know, what, what you know, what am I contributing? What am I taking? What am I giving? And I think I always, um, I I didn't really know for a long time until you know I've actually experienced just a lot of. Um, I've seen a lot of feedback in, in a positive way, and that, that that this is that this is actually doing something. This is helping um, people on this level. But I think music is just one of those things that we we need it. You know, you know, they say that physicians are the doctors for the body, but musicians are physicians for the soul. <laughs> that's a great. That's a great thing. <laughs> yeah. down like I always did and tried to calm her down I 
Son of my warmth and my silence And all she sends me back is rain Universe, she's wounded. She's still got infinity ahead of her. She's still got you and me. And everybody says that she's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, you put your degree in horticulture to good use, and I understand you have a four acre farm in Boulder, Colorado. Yeah, just outside of Boulder, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. You've got bees, chicken, several yeah. sheep, and one of them is named, what, T-Swift for Taylor Swift, right? Oh, I, yeah, well, <laughs> we, there's nine of us out here. We, we, we call them all the T-Swift pack, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what sort of things besides the, uh, the, well, besides the animals that you have, what else are you growing specifically? We, we do a lot of fruit, vegetables, herbs. We're doing, we're, we just started kind of the last couple of years doing the medicinal cannabis and that's oh, been wow. great. Wow. Um, and then, yeah, then we have the bees and, uh, and we also, we have a big barn. We, we throw shows, um, for our that friends that are so cool. sort of passing through. Just, um, it's kind of, yeah. It's, and two of the, my band members live, live here as well. So that's been a really, cre- it's been a really creative kind of space for us to just kind of have like the barn to kind of work in whenever we want. And, now does the farm actually produce revenue are, are you supplying to restaurants or stores or is it just for for self-sustaining lifestyles it's sort of just a, a choice you know i never i think there was a an onion article once um that says like you know like area gardener saves two two dollars and 41 cents you know <laughs> after like 300 hours of labor or something you know but it, it and it is ridiculous it at, at, at times, but there, um, I don't, as it's another thing, I don't know why I do it. Um, <laughs> we, we do have a, we do, ha- we, we do break even and we do have a roadside garden stand and we do, um, and, and then, you know, we are involved in the medicine, the medical stuff that we, we pass on, but, you know, really it's just sort of keeps the, the lifestyle of, of growing food, mm, um, mm. manageable. Now, are you just out of curiosity, are you, uh, are you vegan, vegetarian, I eat fish and eggs and um, babies. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, mostly vegetarian, you know. Uh huh. Very, very cool. So, are you able to feed yourself mostly from your own farm? That's always been a like a goal of mine. It's never. I've never been able to do it totally. Mm. Um, mm. But um, yeah, a lot. You know, we, we do eat a lot of, of food out of there. Oh, that must be so amazing. Uh, uh, have you been able to find a balance between? working your enormous garden and touring. I, I, I think I read in one of your articles that you were trying to aim to tour in the winter months when the ground is fallow and then. Yeah. Be that's been to. sort of a freedom that's been, that's come to me just recently when I can mm. actually um, kind of make that happen, which has been so cool. I've been able to do that for a couple seasons now. Oh, that's, that's great. It's been awesome. We still do a lot of festivals and flyouts, and, and, um, but yeah, last year, you know, we did four months from like January so you know may mm-hmm. so 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 it's it's in terms of having personnel to take care of the farm um you've got that covered yeah well there's nine of us a sort of kind of this unintentional wacky <laughs> community i guess <laughs> and so we all we all sort of have each other's backs in that way you know when, when someone's gone we kind of take care of stuff oh that's really cool yeah you know it's it's we've, we've got this interesting connection um my old company air turn was actually located in netherland Oh, cool! So I've yeah. been to Netherland many, many times. And oh, I, yeah. I, oh, it's gorgeous. Are are you far located far from Netherland? Not too far. No, actually, rec- we recorded the Weatherman up there um, mm-hmm. in a studio up there, and I love it there. It's a really special place to me. Now I understand a lot of really famous artists have recorded up in Ned as well. I, I'm wondering what is it about Ned that makes it so appealing as a recording destination as opposed to Nashville, L.A., or New York. There used to be a, a really famous studio um, called Caribou Ranch. Mm-hmm. I've, I've walked by it, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's there anymore. I think they moved or something mm. happened. I don't, I don't remember, but uh, it is. Um, I didn't record there. I recorded another like little analog studio up there, but I um, pretty small mm-hmm. called the Mountain House, and um, it was just sort of a coincidence that it that happened to be in Netherlands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why there as opposed to maybe one of the other larger 
kind of uh, meccas for for music? I think I was just looking for. I need a lot of isolation, and and I Jamie who tours with with me, he does front of house and, and co produces everything I do and engineers. Um, he lives here as well, and so we kind of found that place together through a mutual friend, and um, so we kind of like to work together. Um, we never think about like a day rate or an hour hourly rate. So we do a lot at home. And this was one specific studio that we could come in for a few weeks, take a little bit of time off, come back for a few weeks. Um, and it, and it didn't like, we weren't totally broke afterwards. You know, afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it can be, you know, cause it's a very, um, it can be recording a record. I'll write, you know, a lot in the, rec- in the studio. Um, more comes out than it, than you think. Um, mm, 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 when you're actually making the, the record, you know, you can kind of have an idea and, and I have, you know, I'll start with 20 songs and end with 11 or 12, but mm. I, a lot happens there and, and it's nice to have that freedom and not thinking about like, oh man, this is like 80 bucks an hour or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. sure. Plus being nestled in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, I'm sure, sure helps with the inspiration, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Traveling through the graveyard with a suitcase full of sparks Honey, I'm just trying to find my way to you I lit up every campfire I found out in the dark Oh, I cut down all the cottonwood Picked up all the arrowheads, all buffalo trails of the Indians The Oklahoma skies cutting through Along the tracks with the runaway He just talks and talks and talks Honey, I'm just trying to find my way to you I quit counting stars that night In the cold by the satellite And I quit pan and gold, digging holes. Yeah, I'm just trying to find my way. Now, you have your own label, Suitcase Town Music. Yeah. And I understand you have your own recording studio on your farm. Is that right? Yeah, we have kind of just like a conglomerate of sort of old gear that um that we kind of all share um (laughs) but yeah we record a lot here as well now are you able to do projects from start to finish at this point with your studio yeah for the most for the most part um you know there is something uh really nice about um working somewhere else that's that's removed from where you sleep (laughs) <laughs> um, but I, I'm learning that that's a, that was a tough lesson. Cause I, you know, you work 14 hour days sometimes in the studio and be like, I'm ready to go home. And you're like, Oh, shit, I am home, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which has been so cool. But at the same time, you, you know, <laughs> you know, there's also that danger of, uh, you know, you listen too much to a pair of uh, speakers or headphones and you just get e- your ears just oh, fatigue. Yeah. yeah? And you just, totally. you're not hearing things fresh. Yeah? So, totally. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It's a little bit like having the office outside of, home and uh, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah and you wake up in the morning and drive to the studio you feel like a real real person so, you know <laughs> make coffee and there drive <laughs> yeah, just... even though you could do it at home right <laughs> you could yes but i do a lot of you know um sketching here i do a lot of um film stuff you know film and tv stuff here Wake up, it's morning Wake up, my darling Wake up and see for yourself You were woven in patchwork 
clouded and haze And you passed like a lover can be Honey, it's alright Honey, it's alright It's alright to be alone It's alright Honey, it's alright Now, speaking of TV, now I understand that McDonald's actually wanted to use your song Big Black Car for one of their commercials. I believe it was the one of the holiday commercials from last year. Is that right? Yeah, um, it was a crazy story. I um, I was on tour up in Canada um, with some friends of ours called Blind Pilot, a band out of Portland. And, um, you know, we were we played. Um, I think the next day someone reached out to me like, yeah, we wanted to use one of your songs for a commercial. And I, would you be open to that? And I was like, hell yeah. We just had, a, <laughs> like, <laughs> we just had a, like a bake sale to pay for gas, you know, and, uh, which is like as a songwriter, you know, a placement, it can be this, it can really turn things around, you know, mm. from, from losing money on the road or whatever it is at the time. And, um, so I was so excited, and then he called back the next day, and he was like, "Well, it's for this. Mc- we got hired to do this Canadian McDonald's commercial." And I was like, "I don't know, man. Like, I'm an organic farmer. I don't think that's gonna vibe. I think, <laughs> I think that's like a little weird, but thank you, you know." I sort of, I sort of passed. And oh, then, interesting, um, interesting. What, what what was it about that? That is it because of what the farming practices that McDonald's is involved with being in conflict with you, your work as an organic farmer? I don't know. You know, it's it's um it's just one of those things where it just didn't feel right to me mm-hmm. to just be a part of something like, mm-hmm. like that, you know, and, uh, and nothing, you know, I don't really, I don't, I've never really eaten at McDonald's. I don't really know, <laughs> but I've been a vegetarian for so long. I, I, I think I heard the, I don't know, whatever. But I don't know if anything's vegetarian there, but, 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 but either way, I think it was sort of just like, I didn't, you know, I really, I was like, man, that's a tough one. You know, we, um, it was a tough decision. And then they called back, they're like totally cool. And the next day they were like, well, you know, we can give you this, this amount of money. This, I think it was like 40 grand or something. Oh crazy. my goodness. Crazy wow. to like more money than I ever like had in my life. At the yeah. Time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I was like, Oh, you know, so I, I thought about it and I was like, yeah, it still doesn't feel right. So thank you very much. And then we, we all came back home to Colorado and we were all, um, hanging out over the holidays and we do this, this show up at this cabin in Gold Hill mm. every year. And we were mm. kind of just, out, out there by the fire and kind of thinking about, and we were like, some dude is just going to do that and buy a Hummer and like, <laughs> let, you know, like, let's just, let's just do this and, and kind of find these cool organizations to donate money to from it. You know, That's incredible. And so we did, and it was a, this coolest thing to get to call these companies and be like, Hey, we like, we're a band and we, we got, we got this placement and we just wanted to give, we just wanted to support some of our favorite like organizations and, for me, a lot of them were farming, you know, based organizations. So it was like Seed Savers Exchange in Iowa, and a couple um, organic farming associations. And uh, we also did a Vietnam vet thing. And, um, and it was so cool. Um, it was such a cool, I've never been able to like have money to give away. Mm. And it was like the coolest thing <laughs> for me. And, wow. you know, it was worth, it, I think it did at the, we have a very like, um, I think very homegrown kind of um, kind of touring fan base and, and very um, I, we had to stay away from the internet for a few months, you know, it was sort of one of those things where we were like, Oh man, mm. like people were like pissed about it for a second. <laughs> we, were like, we were like, that's okay. <laughs> you know? It was, a, a, you know, I, I would do it again easily. Wow. Well, the, one of the things that people, at least the people I've met in Ned, they are certainly very strong-minded, very opinionated, aren't they? <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> but I think it brings up a lot for every, you know, for anyone sure, and everybody. Sure, but that's amazing what you did with that. It was uh, cool. It was uh, a cool thing, and and, yeah. and I didn't even think about it at the time. But the song ended up like going to number one in Canada and Sweden. Wow. wow. And so it, it just really like put us out there in this way. And it was beautiful when they sent me the com- the cut. I was like, dang, like commercials are getting like like sometimes you'll be watching. 
I'll be watching a commercial in a hotel or something and I'll, I'll like get all misty eyed and then I'll be like all state, you know, (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, damn dude, they're getting good at that. You were a phonograph. I was a kid. I sat with an ear close, just listening. Zero when the rain tapped away down your face You were a miracle, I was just holding your space mm. World time has a way of throwing it all in your face The past, she is haunted, the future is laced Heartbreak, you know, drives a big black car I swear I was in the backseat Just minding my own mm. Now, you've collaborated and recorded with alternative country and folk rock singer and songwriter Brandy Carlisle. I'm wondering if you could tell us how you two came to to get to know each other and to tour together. Yeah, I met Brand like uh, six or seven years ago. Mm-hmm. And we played a show at this really beautiful um, kind of big barn in, in Boulder called Chautauqua. It's kind of this beautiful venue. Mm. And, um, we, we, uh, we, we instantly, you know, kind of fell in love with each other's music and hit it off and, and our bands hit it off. And, and we were like, well, if you guys wanted to bring us out, we were working on our first kind of our, our, uh, we were working on, um, we were just touring our first record. That's the gambler at the time. And mm. We were like, if, you know, if you wanted to have us out, we might clear our schedules. And, make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, hell yeah. And I was like, you know, I was, I was working on this, on this record at the time called empty Northern hemisphere. And, and, and I was like, Hey, if, if, if you have any time to just kind of hang out and sing on, on some of these songs. And, and she, I think the, the week after she was like, yeah, I'm home, just come over in Seattle and, and so I just flew out there and we kind of hung out in her barn for a couple of weeks and, 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 and tracked. That and is it was so the, cool. It was the coolest thing and such a generous and amazingly talented musician. Mm, um, she's, so she's we, I toured with her for a long time after that. Wow. Wow. Now, how has your friendship with her impacted your, or has it had an impact in your own musical style or has it impacted your engagement with the music industry? Um, I don't know about that. I think it's sort of, um, you know, I grew up like kind of just like listening, you know, to Leonard Cohen and and Nick Drake and Paul Simon and all these like heroes that are just like, I don't want to meet them. You know what I mean? Like I didn't want to, I don't want to tarnish that kind of like feeling I have with these relationships I have with these Mm. records. You know, I've, I've never been like someone, I've never really had that kind of urge to like kind of, um, stand in line and meet the, you know, have that <laughs> moment. But, but when I, I think when I met Brandy, um, it was like, it was almost like that. It was like, Oh, this is so cool that this, this person is a regular person. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think, it, I think it was my first kind of one of my first, um, experiences of that, of like, mm. Oh, right. Yeah. And that's somebody that can be comfortable being absolutely genuine. Totally. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Do you still stay in touch with her? Yeah. Yeah. We just played, um, here in Colorado at Red Rocks this summer. And then I saw her at a few festivals this, this summer we played. Very, very cool. Yeah. Now, I understand you also had Amy Ray of the Indigo, Indigo Girls on your team at one point, right? Yeah, she was, she became, she was friends with Brandy at the time too. And, and we all became kind of friends and uh, we toured a bunch with them as well. And they're like some of the most amazing people. Mm, um, mm, mm. I, so yeah, I got really, I, I got lucky with, with just really amazing um, people to look up to, you know, um, mm. 
and who treated their support so well and really respected musicians and of any of any level, you know. And I think it really it gave me a lot of hope about about the whole because um, it can go south the other way so easily, you know, where you mm-hmm. kind of just like you're playing a show with somebody and then there's like, oh, yeah, that's the opener table. It's like, cool. <laughs> like, it's like high school kind of all over yeah, again. Yeah, the and popularity this, wars, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or just kind of like the it's very um, you're very aware of your place in, in things. And, and then there's some musicians that are just like, hey, we all. I really love your music and we all kind of are after the same thing, you know. That is awesome. You know, I, yeah. think, the, I think the most successful musicians are the most confident and comfortable. They, they don't feel threatened by anybody. They, they realize that the world is a wide and inclusive place rather than a small pie that you all are fighting after, yeah? Totally, yeah. 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 stops working and you're all run out And all of your high hopes have all hit it south And the songs left the stable and they never came home And there ain't no forgetting that you're out on your own Books to timber and you're left without friends And you don't put your book down even after it ends Smoke curls up from the table in your quiet little room And your heart's worn the handle of an old pushing broom Shine just like stars make a wish anyway. Just you smile, little sixty white bow in my house that was darkened for days. I've been thinking you probably should stay. Now you've played multiple performances with the Colorado Symphony. Yeah, you've also had performances at the Red Rocks Amphitheater, which you just mentioned. And in the new year, I understand that you'll be playing with the Oregon Symphony Orchestra in Portland. Yeah. Now, as a singer-songwriter with such intimate songs, both all in, both in the, the content and also in the sound that you create, I imagine that more often than not, you perform in intimate small places. I, I'm wondering what it was like to hear your songs for the first time with a full orchestra behind you. It was amazing. You know, it was just a- it was kind of like one of the most profound moments that I, I think I've been able to have um, mm. with music and, and with, you know, just kind of like m- mind was blown, you know, mm. kind of just with all these really well-dressed musicians with very good posture and us kind of hobbling out and playing these, <laughs> playing these like weird songs we wrote in their kitchen, you know, <laughs> and so, and it was the coolest thing, you know. And, wow. <clears throat> Mm, mm. Um, it was really intimidating and then at first especially the first show we did with Colorado Symphony because I was just like in awe the whole time and, well, how did this um, collaboration come about? I um, a friend of mine uh, is in a band called Devochka and they're amazing um, he plays violin for them and, and he did some of the scores for, for the symphony shows um, but uh, I, I was talking to him and I realized you know, that would be how amazing that idea was. And I'd seen other artists, you know, Brandy Carlisle had done a few symphony shows. I'd, I'd seen, um, uh, Dvachka had done a, a couple more and, mm-hmm. um, I'd been to, it was amazing. Um, and it was just one of those things, like we all have these little lists that, you know, are like these like unattainable dream <laughs> lists, you know, and, and it sort of, I think I scribbled it down one day and, and I think a couple of years later, I was like, dang, that works. Like, <laughs> write it down, write happening? it down. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was just when I got the opportunity um, to work with Scott O'Neill, who, who was the kind of conductor at the time, mm-hmm. he'd come to a couple of shows that we had played and he was like, I think this is going to work great. And, and, awesome. and the Colorado Symphony was kind of reaching out and doing more pop stuff and, and, and different kind of styles of stuff. Um, and so it was 
So we're like, yeah, let's try it. Mm. Does it. Has it changed at all your concept of writing music? Do you think orchestrally for some songs at all? I always have had that kind of, um, mm. you know, we play with a cello upright yes. and, and a violin player. And we've always, I've always kind of uh, written for, for a band. Um, mm. A couple songs I, I'm like, oh, yeah, this one doesn't need anything. It doesn't, it's just, um, it needs to be as stripped down as possible. But for the most part, I think I write for arrangement. Um, and it was the coolest thing to just get to like, you know, it was like going to Mars, to do that, you know, it was like 80, 75 piece orchestra to, to do these, th- to do these arrangements. Mm, mm. So cool. It's amazing. Dreaming of this golden grain, I'm falling from this shack. Talking sweet to the queen Wishing I was riding with the jacks Walking proud and lonesome now Oh, I'm yearning for the pack But I'd never say I love you, dear Just to hear you say it back Now, I want to get into uh, dig back a little bit into the, the creative process with you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so when you're making a song, what comes first, the music or the words? <laughs> I love that question because I, I have no idea. I, <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think for me, it really does happen. I've never figured this out. I've never had one way that works. Hmm. Um, it usually starts with a melody in my mind. But I, I think it's, yeah, I write more melody based things, but you know, I'll, uh, like I said before, I, 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 write a lot of prose. And so once in a while a line from, from, from my writing just makes it into, makes it into a song or it st- kind of starts the seed of a, of a, of a piece of music. Mm. And then it's sort of, I'll sit with a guitar and it sort of happens at both at the same time. And I'll sort of kind of plant the seed and then it's a, and then it's just like a living thing you're working with the whole time and you're kind of not trying to push too hard you're trying to wait till it's finished um wait till it finishes itself like clock in and be there but i but it's not this forced kind of i gotta finish this today and um that that has never really worked out for me um what you know i've gotten lucky and, and, and a song will happen kind of the instant song, you know, in 10 minutes or something like once in a, <laughs> once in a while, those things are like gold to me, but, um, that's rare, you know? Well, besides your prose that you write yourself, are there other things that you read or listen to or look at to help fuel your creativity or fuel your work? Yeah. You know, I, I read a lot of John Steinbeck, which I, I think mm. he would have been such a kick-ass songwriter. <laughs> I think like his writing is just, um, I mean, like every line could be like this killer song. Mm. Um, I really like him. I, I like Billy Collins a lot. I read a lot of poetry because I, I like I like short pieces of writing and then kind of staring out the window for an hour and, and then kind of like I love that relationship with reading. You know, mm. where where um, um, you have just a short kind of very digestible piece of of, of poetry or writing and and then it kind of like works on you for a while. I love that. Do you? Do you ever read poems from other authors and hear a song generated from those words? Sometimes, yeah, or quality, you know. I think I think poetry is really hard uh, to do well. It's kind of like stand-up comedy, stand-up like comedy, you know. It's like one of the hardest things to do really mm. really poignantly and and um so I love that. I really look up to that. Mm. What what are you hoping what do you want your music to do? What are you hoping that it will achieve? Um, I think, I think at least, you know, I, after a show or something, I, my goal is, is sort of um, people walk away feeling something and kind of like disappearing for for a while and going somewhere and, 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 and it feeds their lives in some way, you know, that's always the goal. Mm. Um, and so as much as I can get out of the way of that, 
the better, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, th I look at, I think about that a lot when I, when I play and I notice that feeling mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. Now your brother, Elon is also a musician and I understand that you collaborate with him sometimes. Yeah, we write together a lot. Um, he used to just come stay with me and every summer and we just kind of play chess and write songs. That is, that is so <laughs> cool. Out. Every day I drink a lot, way too much coffee. <laughs> and just always kind of, he's a genius. Yeah, he, he, I love the music he makes and I'm, I love working with him, you know. Mm -hmm. It's really easy for me to work with. Work with. Now, are your parents, I, I understand that they played certain records when you were growing up, but are your parents musical themselves? Not really. I mean, we sort of just, you know, I think we moved around so much that I think all both my brothers and I just became really close and, and um, music was just something like we did, you know, like mm, mm. eating dinner, or like, you know, video games or something like that. It was just like, let's play. Or, you know. <laughs> and we did play video games too and whatever <laughs> else, but, you know, that was just still like a thing. That was like just a thing. Sure, sure, mm -hmm. sure. Well, how have your parents been supportive of your career? Oh, they're, you know, I think it was, I was, I think they were probably worried for a long time. Like, mm. are you going to get like a real job <laughs> at some point, you know, <laughs> like it's great that there's this awesome futon in the back of your truck, but, you know, <laughs> but I think, I think, I think now I think I may, I might have their favorite job for me because, mm. you know, it's, they'll, they'll come to Europe and for like five or six days and hang out and they'll, you know, come to the shows and have always no, you know, have people at the band and stuff to hang out with and they'll meet us. And they're so amazing. They, they flew out to the Seattle for the Seattle symphony Aww. show. And it's oh, just wow. cool. Wow. It's really, it's really cool that they can, that they can do that now. Cause I, I see them more than I've seen them in a while. You know, that's so wonderful. I think because of, of the travel and there's mm -hmm. Greg, thank you so much for taking the time to yeah, thank you, you. The show. It's, it's, and really for, sharing so much of your life and work. Yeah, thank you so much. This episode of A Musical Life has been brought to you by AirTurn, the makers of digital accessories for musicians like the Go Stand Portable Mic Stand and their line of page-turning pedals for tablets and computers like the Ped and Duo. For gigging musicians, one of the biggest hassles has to be all the gear you have to schlep and set up. The last thing you want to worry about is broken or missing mic stands. Well, why not bring your own? The Go Stand is the world's most portable, full-sized, collapsible mic stand that fits in your backpack. The Go Stand is also available with a telescoping boom, perfect for performing or recording on the road. Visit amusicallife.com forward slash air turn and use coupon code MUSIC10 when checking out to save 10% off of your purchase. Once again, that's amusicallife.com forward slash air turn and use coupon code MUSIC with the number 10, all one word, no spaces. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode at amusicallife.com, where you can see links to Greg's website and all of the songs played from his album, The Weatherman. You'll also find links to his collaborations with Brandy Carlisle, the Colorado Symphony Orchestra, and his song, big black car. If you like this show, please tell a friend or share a link on Facebook or Twitter. Be sure to subscribe to A Musical Life through iTunes or Stitcher or with your favorite podcast playing app. And consider posting a review in iTunes by going to amusicallife.com forward slash review. We're currently listed near the top of iTunes new and noteworthy section of the music podcast category. Your iTunes subscriptions and reviews help to share this show with other listeners. So thank you for all your support. Our show's associate producer is Alison Pokras, and Paul Sung provided production assistance. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.